After our recent video about the debacle of NLX's software upgrade and the way that NLX managed to convert Nikki's and many of our viewers' chargers from useful EVSEs or home charging stations into a delightful ornamental object on the wall that didn't really do anything. We heard from people whose chargers randomly stop mid-cycle, whose chargers will no longer charge at anywhere near their maximum rated speed, and from endless people who'd received totally inadequate responses from NLX's technical support. And the question a lot of you asked is, how do you choose a good charging station? So let's talk about that. So I'm going to start with a quick rundown of the chargers I use, or have used, and why I chose those before we get into some more general advice. But before I do, can I just thank all of you who reached out after Nikki's NLX juice box video. It wasn't only a relief to know that we weren't the only ones, but aside from the few of you who's just said, buy a Tesla charger and a Tesla, it felt like many of you had been feeling like you'd been substantially gaslit. And some of you told us that thanks to our video, you managed to avoid making a very bad purchase decision. Let us know if you'd like us to do more consumer-facing stuff about EV adjacent things in our various comment places. But back to my charging experience. And yes, I know the charger technically lives in the car, but it's become standard nomenclature to call the thing that provides power to the car the charger, even if from an engineering point of view that's not what it is. I've had a variety of chargers over the years. Back in England I had, as part of an EV research project, a free government-supplied charger that was cheerfully simple. You plugged in the car and it charged. No smarts at all. At least not for me. Apparently it had the ability to phone home every so often with usage stats as part of the research project. But otherwise, no smarts. In the US, I had a paddle charger. That remains my favourite. The towel charger that came with our RAV4 had absolutely no smarts, but it was simple and easy to use. You might be sensing a pattern here. But anyway, unless you've got a first generation RAV4 EV, a Chevy S10 EV, or any of those first generation early thousands EVs, that's not really terribly useful information. For the first few years with our BMW i3, I just used the free granny lead that came with the car. I plugged it into a newish outlet outside and the car topped up overnight, mostly. And let me take a moment to remind you that if you're driving less than about 40 miles a day in a reasonably efficient EV, even on the US's feeble 110 volt electrical system, those might come free with your car. Sub $200 chargers are probably adequate. I mean, don't pick the cheapest one off Timu. It's probably going to lack things like an outlet temperature sensor. It might not have proper grounding checks. And it might have a case that cracks the first time you accidentally drop it or, I don't know, look at it funny. But for sure, a reasonable quality, simple box on a string from a reasonably well-known company is fine for a lot of people. And if you're going to use a 110 volt granny lead, do make sure that the socket you plug it into isn't horribly corroded and is ideally on its own properly protected separate circuit, but at least is on a circuit with a GFCI. But if we're talking semi-permanently installed home chargers, since we moved from a rental into our own home, we've had a few different chargers. You know what might be easiest? If we pop outside. The first, and the one that's definitely my favourite, is our Open EVSE. Now ours is an older one, uh, version 4 if I remember correctly, and one that I built up from a kit. It's important to know that while many of the components in an open EVSE are UL listed, the kit as a whole, at least last I checked, is not. And that may matter more to some of you than to others. It didn't really bother me. It's also the thing that Nikki intends to use to replace the innards of her now pretty useless juice boxes with. Because it's actually open source and Unlike a lot of the alternatives, Open EVSE isn't going to suddenly pretend that you don't own it. You can purchase it as a kit or assembled. Ours has this 
ugly ill-fitting bag over the handle because when it rains or snows and then freezes getting a J1772 type 1 handle off the car can be a little bit irritating although the ugly ill-fitting bag is also quite irritating. The Open EVSE has a web configuration utility or you can configure it through the interface on the front. It has a well-documented API which means that if you're the sort of person who wants to control it using some sort of home assistant, I don't know anyone like that, you can. And as of a couple of years ago, it supports the Open Charge Point protocol. I've always intended to get it communicating with Home Assistant and Neon AI, but... Well, my Mycroft running Neon AI is kinda useless. It triggers without wake words so often that it drives me to the brink of hurling it across the room, and certainly my wife gets very annoyed with it if we're in the wrong mood. So it's often left with its microphone switched off, which as a voice activated assistant isn't really ideal. And the current status of my home assistant is a box with a single board computer in it. I've not had time to install it yet. One day though. However, like I said, it does have a nice web administration page through which you can tweak all the settings, update the firmware, monitor its status. Being positioned here on the south wall of our house, it has endured 110 Fahrenheit or 43 degrees Celsius direct sunlight baking it some days, which I know pushed its internal temperature well above 60 degrees, even when it was not plugged in. That sun baking is probably why it looks a little bit faded and sad, but despite that abuse, the cable has remained nice and flexible, even in the five degree Fahrenheit, that's around minus 15 degrees Celsius winter that we had a few years ago. It's basically, touch wood, never given me a problem and I love it, despite using basically none of its smart features. I do have it linked with Emon CMS, which is a powerful open source web app for processing, logging and visualizing energy, temperature and other environmental data. I don't really use it though, I just now and then I look at it and go, ah, interesting. It also has the capacity to be linked to solar, so you could limit or control your power consumption such that you're only preferentially using your solar power. And I understand if you wanted to put in the effort, you could make it do load sharing for multiple units on a single circuit. I haven't though, because I don't need to. It has its own dedicated 50 amp circuit in here. But yeah, at some point I will try and make a video about setting up Home Assistant and Neon AI with it. Maybe if there's demand, let us know in Discord or on Mastodon, or of course in the Patreon comments. And in the meantime, Nikki's current favourite pastime is Home Assistant, so there are already several videos available on the channel, so check them out. Okay, so the Open EVSE does exactly what it says on the tin, and these days they do a 48 amp version. It's a proper open source project, so it's unlikely to go the way of the juice box, and they sell spares. So if something does break, you can fix it. It's basically my favorite kind of device. What we have over there on the north wall is a little bit different. Welcome to the north wall. Well, all right, it's the north wall of our garage. On this wall, we have this unit, which actually is a replacement for the other charger that I told you about. That was a Siemens unit that was once Nikki's. It was the one that was replaced by Nikki's juice boxes. That Siemens unit was very basic. You set the maximum current on installation and you did that inside the unit using a small selector. It had some options for delay timing, I think four of them, and that was it. No other connected smarts at all other than the required ones for safety. A while back we replaced that with this. This is a review unit from Autel, which we have a review of up here, but wait before you go to look at that because we need to update some things. It's been in service for about a year and a half. It's a smart charger which is linked to the internet and it has its own app. And at the time that we did the review it supported the open charge point protocol and we were told as were other reviewers and outlets at the time, that it would do dynamic load sharing using a device installed in the panel. Not just load sharing with other EV chargers from Autel, but for the panel's whole load. 
That meant that folks with a limited supply could install this and make use of all the spare capacity in their supply when it was available, but have it ramp down EV charging when they turned on their cooker or their air conditioning. Which is nice and really important for getting more people charging. However, Autel never got back to me on the final process for installing the actual monitoring unit that needed to be installed in the panel, despite promises that they would. Nor have they supplied a review unit for that, so yeah, that's not helpful. And the Open Charge Point Protocol integration disappeared a while back with a firmware update, and now isn't mentioned anywhere on their residential units, which is annoying because that's how I was planning to integrate it into our home assistance system when I get around to building it. It's another great example of n shitification from a company. So, yay. I'll also say that after a year, this cable is less flexible and more twisted than our open EVSEs after nearly five years, which is disappointing, but otherwise it's worked well. It's a little aggravating that it wanted to do Bluetooth firmware updates, and at least one of them required my phone to stay close to the charger for about 15 minutes which doesn't sound like that much, but I really didn't want to just stand around outside in the cold and the rain for 15 minutes. So I ended up propping my phone up here on the charger and then just keeping an eye on it while I was pottering around, because since our charger is street facing, I don't like leaving my brand new phone up here. But it hasn't demanded an update for a while, and you could, to be fair, just use it not connected to the internet. Okay. So that's the chargers that I have, and a very, very quick rundown of my experience with them. But it's cold out here, threatening to rain, so let's hop back inside and answer the question, how should someone go about choosing an EV charger? Oof, it's chilly out there. So, assuming you have somewhere to install the charger, the first question to ask is, what do you need? Like I said, I got on just fine for quite a while with the 110 volt charger that came with the i3. It wasn't ideal for my situation, a 50 mile commute with less than 10 hours between being plugged in and leaving again, because I couldn't quite refill that i3 Rex all the way. But in that case, I was able to use the range extender for a little bit of my journey and did the rest on electric. But if you can manage with topping up between three and five miles per hour on a charge for a typical EV, then a 110 volt charger might be enough. But if you need or want something a little more permanent, then take a bit to ask yourself a few questions. How much do you want to spend? Decent level two chargers start at around $450. There's a bunch of them at that price point. Do you have capacity in your panel? And if so, how much? Many homes have a 200 amp service, which is typically enough spare power to install a decent 10 kilowatt charger. That will do most folks for most driving, but if you've only got a 100 amp service, you might start to find things are getting a little tight. What are the capabilities of your current car? It's becoming increasingly common in the US to see vehicles that can charge at more than the 7-ish kilowatts that's been the standard for a long time. Although just because your EV can charge faster doesn't mean you necessarily need it to. And how long are you planning to keep your current car? Because if you're thinking about owning something with a better charging capability than the one you have in the not too distant future, it might be worth getting a charger that's more capable than the one that you need right now. It's certainly worth making sure that the circuit you put in for the charger, if you need to add a new circuit, is as highly rated as you can manage in that case. But if you're like me and planning to drive basically until the wheels fall off your car, then that doesn't matter so much. All our chargers are 40 amp, in part because I chose when I was installing the cable to just run 50 amp circuits for charging, but also because I really don't need more. Even with the review vehicles, there's not a lot of point in me having anything bigger than the 40 amps that I have, like a 50 or even 80 amp charger, because if I need to, I'll just run to a rapid charger. And this past week, I drove just over 220 of my car's 240 mile winter range without stopping to charge, but even still throwing it on the charger when I got home at 5pm, it was full again before one in the morning. 
Okay, so for most people, something between a 32 and a 48 amp unit is probably going to be fine. But if you're driving a Hummer, a Rivian R1T or an F-150 Lightning and you're doing a lot of miles, you might want to pick something up at the beefier end, or beefier indeed. And then the other question is, do you want some kind of smart home link? Or would you rather just have a simple charger that does nothing overly complicated? Because like many things, the challenge with the former is that what you're effectively buying at this point is a software license. And as NLX and Autel so handily demonstrated, features that you think you've bought can vaporize because they are subject to change. And all I can say is try and choose a company you trust to keep the features you want. In my case, because I'm an evil communist jerk of a Tesla Stan soy boy cuck apparently, Sorry, I made a mistake of looking in the comments a few days ago and the disinformation and hate is whew, spicy. For me, that's going to be a company that's committed to open source technology and principles and also to the right to repair. But if you want to integrate everything into Google, Apple or Amazon's ecosystems, then you need to choose something that's compatible with those. Oh, and I should know this by now, but sometimes I forget. Never trust a company who swear blind that a feature is definitely coming soon. Once it's there and working reliably, you can believe that feature is available and functional. So many times over the years I've bought hardware based on future promises that were coming with a firmware update. And the number of times that firmware update has ever actually arrived is vanishingly small. As to how to check a specific charger is well designed, meets its specs and is likely to last well? Well, Honestly, we don't do a lot of charger reviews here because, to be honest, it's a bit of a specialist topic. And if we did review every charger that we got offered, we'd never do anything else. But Tom from State of Charge does review a phenomenal range of chargers and his reviews are in-depth and thorough. We've dropped a link in the doobly-doo to his channel because if you want to know if a specific charger is worth a punt, he's really the guy to ask. But also remember we do offer consultancy services so if you have a more specific question you'd like us to answer, check those out. Otherwise I hope that's given you some useful tips and we'll be back soon with more news from the world of cleaner transportation. Thanks for joining me today and if you've got thoughts make sure you leave them below in our discord chat room or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube. Covering our bills, paying our team and making sure that we can be 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Carl B. Knapp, Stoyl Pankoff, Smithers, John Strott, Kelly, Joseph Valentinetti, John Flint, and Nate Fritz. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations, and we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. Address is also down below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below too. This month, we're celebrating Electric for Everyone with an amazing new t-shirt designed by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you've subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving!